What will you do when a masked gunman jumps out onto the roof from a helicopter? You will probably be terrified, right? But what happened in Vosburga not only shocked the world, but also foxed the police. Stick on as we are going to unravel the story of the group who robbed a cash depot with the help of a helicopter. In the early hours of September 23, 2009, around 5 a.m., the overnight crew of the G4S Cash Service Building in Vosberga, Sweden were going about their daily tasks, including counting money on the sixth floor after receiving it from the vault on the second floor. It was a poor building design that couldn't be changed, but it would unknowingly make them a target. At around 5.15 a.m., the group leader Oscar Lindgren began hearing a rattling of the windows. At first, he thought nothing of it, attributing the sounds to the idling trucks outside waiting for the cash. The truck sounds were so common that the team would often joke about it sounding like someone was coming to rob. But little did they know that what they were joking about was going to get real. At this time, the vibrations were felt and heard in the insulated cash room. And that wasn't a joking matter. It was clear it wasn't just trucks. Oscar ordered the team to stop and turn off the machine so he could hear the sound better. It was so out of place they called the security team on the third floor to investigate. Oscar then left the insulated room to investigate the commotion. Outside of the room, on the far side of the building, he saw two men all dressed in black wearing motorcycle helmets and a third coming down a set of ladders leading to the window. Around the ladders on the floor lay broken glass, and Oscar realized what was going on. He shouted to his team, alerting them they were being robbed and triggered the panic alarm. He ran back, shutting two doors behind him, one held by a simple bolt lock and the other a thick steel door. He had his team send what money they had already counted down the elevator to the vault and then instructed them to padlock the cages with the uncounted cash. They then ran to the corner of the room and waited for the police to arrive. The main door was a forced entry resistant door designed to withstand up to 15 minutes of heavy duty attacks. The windows beyond the door were thick bulletproof glass. The team was sure the police would arrive before the men were even close to reaching them. Several minutes away, Johan Peterson, the director of security for the GS4, received a call from the security team that they were being robbed. Peterson grabbed his laptop and rushed over to the building. Police were already on their way and were prepping their helicopters to meet him there. Except what Peterson didn't know was that the police couldn't get to the building and the helicopters weren't on their way. Actually, the police were on their way but were forced to stop about 650 yards out because along the five different roads leading to the building, they found chain connecting caltrops designed to pierce any tire that drove over it. Caltrops are large metal spikes, usually three or four pronged. No car is driving over one unscathed. And this is where it gets really interesting. 25 miles away at the hangar, two pilots arrived ready to take two choppers to the G4S building. But from a distance, they could see two metal boxes with a red light blinking. One was at the entrance door and the other was on the tarmac. They were bombs and they were ready to explode. The pilots couldn't risk them exploding near the jet fuel and couldn't be certain there weren't any more out of view. This led police to realize the people robbing the G4S building weren't just a bunch of opportunists with a helicopter, they were dealing with professionals. Back in the building, Oscar and his team had now heard the third explosion and the latest one told them the thieves were close to getting into the room. Oscar made the decision to break protocol and evacuate his team, leading them down the elevator and out to the second floor vault. Moments later, a fourth explosion allowed the thieves into the room. Johan Patterson finds the police command center, sets up his laptop, and taps into a live feed of the cameras. The police, having heard the explosions and knowing they were dealing with professionals, refused to go into the building until they were certain it was safe. Until then, they could do nothing but watch with Peterson as one of the three men used a buzzsaw to break through the padlocks on the cash cages, while the other two walked around with weapons in their hands waiting for their moment. They watched them pack millions of bills into their sacks. They watched them for 15 minutes and then the men stopped. The men grabbed their sacks of cash, headed back to the ladders, and lifted their money up. The police down on the ground could see the helicopter, which had been hovering for the last 30 minutes, land, pick up the men, and then fly off as if they hadn't just executed a history-making heist with no one able to stop them. Perfectly planned crime, right? But no. Actually, the thing is, the officers knew that the heist was going to happen, and they already had a suspect that they were tracking from the very beginning. The National Criminal Investigations Department in Sweden known as the RKP were in charge of investigating the robbery, and they already had Goran Boyevich, 
the Mastermind, under surveillance since late August. While Goron was finalizing his plan in early September, he met with his two associates at the marina, one of them was actually an undercover officer, and at this point, Goran's car and phone had been bugged. And as a suspect, they paid more attention to the trace they had placed on his phone and found it matched the locations of the prepaid phones that were used in the heist. From there, the police pulled the records of that prepaid phone and found it was contacting a dozen other prepaid phones. Those phones only contacted each other and created a sort of closed web between them. Police could then use this to compare to other suspects. It is also reported that Stockholm police had previously received information that a helicopter heist was being planned in the area, but that the National Task Force had been conducting surveillance at the wrong depot in Bromma, in the northwest of the city. Alexander Eriksson, his associate, managed to steal a Bell 206 helicopter from Roslagen's helicopter base in Norotalia, was arrested shortly after while trying to book a trip to the Canary Islands. Whereas, suspected mastermind Goran Boyovich, who had been spotted driving his new BMW around town, was arrested in his apartment, where a bag of cash was seized. The police were also able to retrieve DNA from the pieces of the glove that were left, and partial prints from the bombs that turned out to just be an empty metal box with a red light bulb powered by a battery. The zip ties also left at the scene of the abandoned helicopter provided some DNA. It was matched to Safa Khatoum, who was later arrested in the Dominican Republic. In all, 10 men were charged with robbery or complicity in a trial held in the basement of Stockholm's police headquarters, so there's no chance a helicopter can land on the flat roof of the courthouse. Seven men were imprisoned. Kadam, who confesses, and Eriksson, who pleads not guilty, get seven to eight years each. Boyovich gets three to four years for planning the G4S robbery. He can't be definitively placed inside the helicopter, and another four for an unrelated reason. Their accomplices get five years or less. However, most of the stolen cash, believed to be somewhere between $5 million to $8 million, is still missing. Investigators suspect around 20 people were somehow linked to the heist, which means more than half of the crew is still on the loose. The rest are out of prison. And that wraps up today's content. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and also don't forget to subscribe to our channel.